professor of political science at Texas Tech University. She's the chief scientist for the Nature Conservancy and understands the importance of climate communications. And we hope we'll be learning more about that from Dr. Hayhoe today. Dr. Hayhoe is the author of Saving Us, a climate scientist's case for hope and healing in a divided world. Today, we will have a presentation from Dr. Hayhoe followed by a question and answer period moderated by Senator Kutcher. I'll now turn this session over to you, Dr. Hayhoe. Thank you again for joining us today. And we're all very much looking forward to hear, hearing what you have to say. Dr. Hayhoe. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I wanted to begin by just telling you a little bit about how I came to care about the issue of climate change and why I'm now spending all of my days um, and often some of my nights too. There we go. <laughs> that was the book I wrote last year, um, <laughs> talking to people about climate change. So I'm from Toronto, from Etobicoke specifically, and um, I grew up really interested in science. I didn't really have much of a choice because my dad was a science teacher. And in fact, um, by the time he retired, he was the science coordinator for the Toronto Board of Ed. So I grew up with the idea that science was the most fascinating thing you could possibly study. Who wouldn't want to understand why the sky was blue or how plants suck up CO2 or why polar bears actually have translucent fur and black skin. So I always was interested in science, but for me, what was most interesting was finding out about all of the things that we have never even had a chance to see until we develop more and more powerful telescopes. And you know what I'm talking about because we have the James Webb telescope that just went up recently and you've probably seen all the photos coming out of that telescope of things that no human eye has ever seen before. And it's just amazing the things you can discover when you study the universe. I also knew that I wanted to make a difference to help people, but I felt like I don't really have abilities or talents or skills in economic development or in the medical field. And so I thought, well, maybe the next best thing I can do is just help people understand how the world works because surely that information will be of assistance to people. And of course it already has. So I was almost finished my undergraduate degree at the University of Toronto studying physics and astronomy when I needed an extra class, an extra breadth requirement. And this is actually an argument for continuing to require breadth requirements because I looked around and I had already finished a minor's degree, a minor degree in Spanish, because when I was nine years old, my family moved down to Colombia in South America, where we lived for a number of years. And I saw a brand new class on climate change in the geography department. And I thought, well, why not take that? That looks interesting. I had learned in I think it was grade 10 in the Ontario curriculum, we had learned about deforestation and air pollution and climate change and biodiversity loss. And I thought of those as issues that environmentalists care about and environmentalists like David Suzuki will fix and the rest of us can watch their documentaries and support them and wish them well. That's how I thought about these issues. But when I took that class, that was when I learned for the first time how urgent climate change is, how it's no longer a future issue. It's an issue that was already affecting us then and is affecting us even more today to the point where we can all point our fingers at some way that climate change is impacting the places we love, the people we love, the things we love. I also learned that climate change is not only an environmental issue, it is an environmental issue, but it is also a health issue. It's a water issue, a food issue. It's an economic issue. It's a poverty issue. It is a biodiversity issue. It affects almost every aspect of our lives. And so at its core, climate change is profoundly a humanitarian issue, a human issue. So when I realized that, and when I realized that I accidentally had the exact skill set, or maybe I should say serendipitously, rather than accidentally, had the exact skill set that you needed 
to study the impact that humans are having on our planet, not just the impact we've already had, but even more importantly, the impact that we will have in the future, depending on the choices we make today. So that is still in our hands. I thought, how can I not do everything I can to help fix this issue? Because it's so urgent, surely we'll fix it soon. And then I can go back to studying astrophysics. <laughs> and that was a very long time ago. That was more than 25 years ago at this point. But since then, we've learned a lot. Oh, go ahead. Question? Oh, okay. I, I'm actually going to, um, I'm going to pause a couple of different times as we go along for questions because I'm going to talk about a few different things. And so what I want to do now, first of all, is I want to talk about why climate change matters to us and everything that I've learned, not just back then, but since then, about why it matters. Because that's really the foundation to how do we talk about it is understanding why it matters. Because often we assume, well, it matters to me because of this reason, and it should matter to everyone else because of the same reason. And so we start from that basis, whereas in fact, everyone has different priorities. Everyone has different values. Everyone has different things that are at the top of their list of what they most care about. And often for people, they haven't made the connection between what's at the top of their list and how climate change is affecting it. So just starting there, let me go ahead and put myself into screen share mode just a second. I think I have permission. Oh, can I get permission to share my screen? Is that possible? I think someone might have to make me a co-host or yep, just we're doing that right okay. now. Okay, perfect. Second. Thank you. Mm. Okay. There we go. All right. Let me just share here. So the biggest thing I've learned is that it really isn't about saving the planet. And so often we use those words. We hear people talking about what can you do to save the planet? 10 things you can do with your family to save the planet. The most important thing you can do to save the planet. But here's why that is neither accurate nor effective. First of all, the planet itself will be orbiting the sun long after we're gone. It really is not about saving the planet. It is quite literally about saving us us humans and many of the other living things that share the planet with us. But why, why is there a problem with this language? It's because it sets up a false conflict between people or the planet, between the economy or the environment, between climate action or the future of the human race and the human society as we know it. But the reality is, is the planet can survive without us. We cannot survive without the planet. When we look at the science of how this is affecting us, we see that this extra blanket of heat trapping gases that we are digging up all of our fossil fuels and burning, producing heat trapping gases that are building up in the atmosphere, wrapping an extra blanket around the planet. This extra blanket that's causing the planet to warm is disrupting our water supplies. It is increasing the contamination of our water. It is leading to record breaking droughts where people don't have availability of water and water is essential to life on this planet. It's also affecting the air we breathe. A shocking statistic that not enough people know is that breathing in the air pollution from burning fossil fuels, not the heat trapping gases, just the particulates and the pollution from burning coal and gas and oil, is responsible for 10 million premature deaths per year around the world, which is double the number of COVID deaths per year. Then we've got the impact of our warming planet on the food we eat. Higher carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere mean that the food plants are growing faster, but with less nutrients. So in a country like Canada, where most of us have access to adequate nutrition or vitamins, if we don't, that's not such a big deal. But 
if we live in a low income country where we don't have access to sufficient nutrition, then we see the nutritional content of our food is going down at the same time as stronger droughts and floods and heat waves are impacting food supply. Since the 1980s, $5 billion US in crops have been lost per year due to climate extremes. And then there's the fact that all of our infrastructure, our roads, our buildings, our water systems, our supply chains, our power grids, they're all built for a planet that no longer exists. Our conditions on this planet are changing faster than any time in the history of humans on this planet and that's why it matters it isn't about saving the planet it's about saving us the biggest way that i as a scientist see this extra blanket affecting us personally today is through the impact that it's having on our weather extremes now, as far back as we can go in the planet's history, we know that we've always had droughts and heat waves, wildfires, storms. That's a normal part of life on this planet. But as the planet warms decade by decade, it's loading the weather dice against us. It's like wherever we live, we have a pair of natural weather dice and we always have a chance of rolling a double six. I'm from Toronto and I grew up on stories of Hurricane Hazel hitting the city. We know that we've had hurricanes in Canada before. We know that wildfires are a normal part of our life in northern and western Canada. We know that there have been floods and heat waves, but we also know that as the world is getting warmer, it's as if it's sneaking in and taking a number on our diet and turning it into another six, and then another six, and then a seven. And we say, how could this be? How could we have, you know, in the US this summer, the United States had five 1,000 year flood events in five weeks. And we say, how could this happen? It's happening because climate change is loading the weather dice against us. And we are seeing this around the world. The devastating heat wave and wildfires that we saw in BC last summer, science has shown were 150 times more likely because of climate change loading the weather dice against us. We're seeing climate change make droughts stronger. We're seeing climate change supersize our hurricanes that we just saw the last two weeks. Hurricane Fiona making it all the way up to Newfoundland is the strongest storm, the strongest extra tropical storm to hit Canada. Um, our science has already showed that 10% of the rain that fell during Ian would not have happened if it weren't for a changing climate. Hurricane Harvey, it's more like 40%, the one that hit Houston, Texas five years ago. And we even see how these extremes are exacerbating failing states and vulnerable societies. So this is a story from last year talking about Afghanistan. And of course, in Afghanistan, their problems are primarily political. But climate change is, as the US military calls it, a threat multiplier. And so the fact that parts of Afghanistan have warmed twice as much as the global average and their spring rains have declined and their droughts are more frequent. What's happening is that it is the effects of warming, as it says in the third paragraph, act as what military analysts call threat multipliers, amplifying conflicts over water, putting people out of work in a nation where people largely live off agriculture. And as one professor of hydrology who studies water says, the war has exacerbated climate change impacts because for 10 years, over 50% of the national budget goes to war. Now there is no government and the future is unclear. Our current situation today is completely hopeless. We see these impacts around the world. And what they have in common is that they affect all of us but they don't affect us all equally. Climate change affects every single one of us if we live on this planet, but it doesn't affect us equally. The people who have done the least to contribute to the problem are most vulnerable and it's affecting every aspect of our lives. So you might, when I say climate, you might not think that climate change is an infrastructure problem. 
But it is because, again, our infrastructure was built for conditions that no longer exist. You might not think that climate change is an economic problem, but it's already causing billions of dollars worth of damage. Just looking at the insured damages from our weather extremes in Canada and in the US, we are already into billions of extra dollars. Climate change is an energy problem because it affects the supply of our energy. It affects the demand of our energy as well. I've already mentioned how it's a water problem, how it affects our natural resources and our health. It affects our food, our biodiversity and our conservation efforts. And climate change is an issue of justice and equity because although it affects all of us, it does not affect all of us equally. And those of us who are already people who are already marginalized, people who are already disadvantaged, people who already suffer from socioeconomic inequality, from racial inequality, from gender inequality, those people are most affected by these impacts because they're already most vulnerable. So whatever you're interested in, you can see something here that relates directly to climate. And for me personally, what really hit me when I was taking that class so long ago at University of Toronto was the fact that climate change is so unfair. We see that the 50% poorest people in the world are responsible for 7% of the problem. The richest 1% are responsible for 15. Actually, that number's increased. Now we're up over 20%. And if you flip it around, this is who's responsible, who's producing the heat trapping gases. If you flip it around and you say, who is exposed to these impacts? We see that first of all, people who are not responsible and that they have just been born, people who have just been born the last few years are bearing the brunt of the impacts of the choices that people made. This is comparing lifetime exposure to climate extremes for people who were born just three years ago compared to people who were born in 1960. And you can see that almost everywhere, the colors are darker, meaning more people are being exposed. I'm not quite sure what's going on with Ireland. That's something interesting to look at. But other than that, more people are being exposed in the future. And even when you look at today, for people who are born in the same year, People in lower income countries are much more exposed than people in higher income countries. The top countries on the li this list are Malawi, Somalia, countries in Africa, countries in Southeast Asia. You have Australia up there, which has the wildfires, the droughts, the heat waves, and the cyclones. Then you have the US down there at number, what is that, 15 or so. But I can't even see, oh, there's Canada. We're way at the bottom way, way, way at the bottom. Yet we just suffered from Hurricane Fiona ourselves. In Malawi, they outlawed child marriage over five years ago. And there was initially a decrease in child marriages in Malawi. But the last two or three years, they've been ticking back up again. And there isn't a scientific study showing this yet, but when people who work in that area go into the villages and ask people, why, why is this happening? The answer they get is, we didn't have food. The droughts that are being amplified, exacerbated, made more intense and more devastating by a changing climate are directly hitting people's food supply to the point where often they have no other choice. But the science is showing that at the global scale, the gap is getting bigger. The economic gap between the richest and poorest countries has already increased by 25% since the 1960s. So when it comes to climate change, it affects all of us, but it doesn't affect us all equally. Women and children, especially in low-income countries, indigenous communities who have already lost their rights to so much of their land and their sovereignty, low-income neighborhoods. And we might think, well, that's a US problem, but no, we see this in low-income neighborhoods in our big cities in Canada as well. These are the ones who are most impacted by a changing climate. So what I've realized is to care about climate change, you don't have to be a member of the Green Party or the Liberal Party or the NDP or any party at all. You don't have to live in Canada or in Malawi, in Argentina or California. You don't have to be a certain age or a certain type of person of a certain faith. To care about climate change, you only have to be one thing. And that one thing is quite literally a human being living on this planet. Because if we are, we have every single reason to care because it really isn't about saving the planet, it's about saving us. 
So I want to stop here before I pivot to talking about how do we talk about this effectively in such a polarized world. Um, I want to stop here and say any questions about um, the science, about the impacts, about how it's affecting us, about things that you've seen that you were wondering about or about what this means for Canada. Okay, I have uh, Senator Galvez and then Senator Quinn. If you could go ahead, thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Reichow. Um, as you as I'm, I am a scientist, and I think that we have read exactly the same documents, the same info, the uh, same IPCC report, so we arrive at the same conclusions. Uh, but um, <coughs> there are solutions. There, are, there is technology. There is some policies. As senators, we have a um, toolbox that we can uh, push and implement, so to stop, so attenuate, so to adapt to us, what you said, it's an already changed um, planet. And that you said that, and I agree, that um, climate change is a systemic risk, is here to stay, and is um, in, uh, impacting everywhere, everyone. Um, so I want to ask you, you know, um, for wh where we start, according to you, if you will be in our position, where do we start? And uh, to accelerating into the decarbonization of our economy and becoming more sustainable. Thank you. That is a great question. And that is exactly the next question to ask, <laughs> since as you say, we've read all the same things and come to the same conclusion. And so that's exactly where I'm going next. But I wanna give you a short answer to that though, because this is so important. I have asked myself this question ever since I realized how big this issue was. And so at first I thought, well, people don't know the facts. But then I realized that's not enough. That's not changing minds. And then I thought, well, people need to understand how it's affecting them. And that does matter. But that's still not enough if people don't know what to do. And then you can start talking about what to do. And then people are like, oh, well, you know, or you can start implementing what to do, like implementing a price on carbon, implementing sensible policies putting in incentives for public transportation, electric grids for, for vehicles, um, adaptation. But there's one thing that I realize we're missing, and that is the catalyst. The catalyst to change in human society is when we talk about it, when we communicate with each other. Because we can have the best ideas in the world, we can have the best policy in the world, we can have the best solutions in the world, but if we haven't put the pieces together on why it matters to all of us and how we can all benefit, <laughs> then we're not going to get that ball rolling down the hill as fast as it needs to. So that's why when, when they asked me to do a TED talk a couple of years ago, I said, I'd like to do a TED talk on the most important thing an individual can do about climate change. And, and they're like, well, we already have TED talks on plant-based diets and <laughs> electric vehicles. And, all. and I said, no, I think as, as individuals, whoever we are, whether we are a scientist or a senator or both, or whether we're simply just a parent taking our child to school, we're a medical professional, we're a teacher, we're a neighbor, we're a fellow churchgoer, whoever we are, when we use our voice, that is how we catalyze change in the place where we are because we're all part of a system that's greater than ourselves. And so, you know, I would put, I would have posters on bus shelters saying, here's, you know, Jeremy from Sault Ste. Marie and here's how much he saved on the carbon tax this year. I would have, you know, here's here's the incentive for this here's what you can do for that here's what's available for businesses i would just communicate every single piece of solutions we have here's what we already have here's what we're already doing here's what we want to do next here's what we could do if we had support really really communicating why it matters and what we can do to fix it are the two most important things in the frame of leading us all to a better future too often we're talking about what we have to run away from. And I just did that myself. I talked about what we have to run away from, but we don't talk about what we need to run together too. And when it all comes down to it, we all want a better future. Doesn't matter what side of you know the country we're from. It doesn't matter who we voted for in the last election. It doesn't matter where our parents came from. We all want a better future. And if we can begin with that better future, go one step down to visualize what that better future looks like for us, 
we probably reach agreement on a lot of those things, not all of them, but a lot. And then we could say, what do we need to do to get to that? And that completely flips the conversation on its head. So I'm going to go there next, but I wanted to give that answer. Thank you. Great. Okay, Senator Quinn and then Senator Gerba, and then we'll let you get on, uh, Dr. Hale, to the next part. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Hale. This is this is the most plain language presentation I've seen um, ever, and it's so striking and so hard hitting. Um, and my question really is that it's it's what you've done is you've really demonstrated this is a global issue. It isn't a Canada issue, a U.S. It's a global issue, and yet. All of our, you know, countries and associations, we put plans in place and whatnot. And seeing this type of information, it's almost like we're tinkering around the edges. And like as we go forward, climate change gets worse. Do we have a chance? Do we have a chance if we continue to tinker? Do we have a chance at saving us? Well, that's the question that I've gone into very deeply, so deeply, in fact, that that's what I research. I look at what's going to happen depending on the choices we make. And so I, I do exactly the experiment that you said. I said, okay, if we do nothing, what's going to happen? If we tinker, what's going to happen? If we start slow but speed up, what's going to happen? And if we go all in, what's going to happen? And the difference is the future of human civilization as we know it. If we do nothing, or if we continue to tinker, our systems are gonna break down. Our water systems, our supply chains, our electricity systems, our infrastructure systems. And we're already seeing the beginning of that breakdown. And we see that climate change is not the only disruption. COVID breaks down some of these systems as well, especially our supply chains, our health system, our social networks. But if we do everything we can, and even if we start slow and accelerate, we can still maintain our civilization with significant adaptation. And that's why our adaptation is so important. And we had that report that series of reports that are coming out on adaptation in Canada. And that's something that we have to incorporate into our work in other countries as well as helping them to prepare and adapt. And that's what the next big climate conference that's coming up in November is about specifically is all those low income countries who haven't really done anything to cause the problem yet they're bearing the brunt of the impacts. How do we help them adapt? But if we do everything we can and we accelerate that boulder down the hill, we can save ourselves. And that's why I'm fighting so hard. Stan, I think you're muted. Sorry. Of course I am. Senator Gerva, uh, question over to you. Last one for this section. Yep, over to you. Merci, merci. Um, Senator Thank, you. Uh, Thank you, Senator Kutcher. Thank you to our keynote speaker as well. As our colleague mentioned, Senator uh, Coyle mentioned, uh, this is Senator Quinn mentioned, this is a lot of information that allows us to see indeed that it's a global problem and that it impacts different communities and countries in an unequal and disproportionate way. And Dr. Heho, you also mentioned that the countries that the, the least to pollute the planet are having the hardest time. And that makes me think of African countries um, where climate problems are making life unlivable, solutions are costly, but they maybe are responsible for two to 3% of, uh, of pollution. So what is the solution? What is a fair solution that can apply to these countries? How can we help these countries reach a certain level of resilience? Because they are right now suffering and it is getting worse with the war in Ukraine, 
the food crisis uh, that they're going through, um, the increasing price of grains and other food items. So how do we deal with all this for these countries? How can we help them out? Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for speaking so slowly and clearly so I could understand everything that you said. So this is, you asked the question that's at the heart of this issue, which is how do we help the countries and the people who have done the least to contribute to the problem, yet are bearing the brunt of the impacts? And that is both an ethical question, because it's not fair, but it is also um, a practical question. Because where do people go when um, disasters overtake the place where they live. Many conflicts are resource based. Where do people go? They're displaced from their homes and many people come to Canada and we take people in because that's who we are. But if you look at the coming refugee crises, if we do nothing or if we continue to tinker, we are not able to absorb the flood of refugees. Just to give you one example, 700 million people live in the low elevation coastal zone. 700 million. 50% of the area that the country of Bangladesh uses to grow rice will be underwater by the end of the century if we do nothing. So, and not only that, but people want to stay in their homes. You know, providing a safe haven for the entire world is not only impractical, but it's not the idea, it's not the better future that people want. So often, and you might have heard this too, but I often hear what low income countries need is they need more fossil fuels because fossil fuels made us wealthy and developed and they need fossil fuels too. But if you look at where the fossil fuels are in the world, the vast majority of fossil fuels are in North America. They are in Russia. China has a good supply of coal. They're in the Middle East. And then they're in just a few countries like Venezuela and the Niger Delta, where those fossil fuels are being extracted by multi multinational corporations and they're being taken to supply high income countries. They're not being used to benefit the people there. So when we say low income countries need fossil fuels, we're not saying they need to depend on their resources the way we depend on our resources. We're saying they need to buy them from us, which means they need to go into even greater debt to develop an unsustainable way of getting energy that will continue to damage them. It's like making people addicted to cigarettes and then giving them, you know, giving them more tobacco because they can't grow it themselves. We need to invest in clean energy solutions because electricity is most closely correlated with human well being. Not energy itself, but electricity specifically. And so that's why in my book, um, as you probably know, Senator Coyle, I talk about um, Solar Sister, an amazing program that empowers women entrepreneurs in Sub Saharan Africa with solar technology. I'm also going to talk here about the importance of things like regenerative agriculture, the nature conservancy that I serve as chief scientist, which is, it's called Nature United in Canada. I know that's confusing, but we already had a nature conservancy of Canada. So the nature conservancy in 80 countries around the world is called Nature United in Canada, but we're working in many African and Southeastern Asian countries on regenerative agriculture. And I'm talking to folks in Canada too about regenerative agriculture, about drought resistant agriculture, about the way that we can use nature to help us adapt, be more resilient, absorb water when it floods, shade our homes when there's heat waves, protect us from climate impacts, but also help us grow more food and even generate energy. So the solution is really to invest. And that's why along in the Paris Agreement, along with the goals of reducing emissions for countries like Canada, there was also goals of contributing to the Green Climate Fund. But most countries didn't. Even the United States under President Obama only contributed half of what they said they would. We were one of the countries that did the best, but we still need to do more. And it's not only about money, it's about knowledge, technology, investment, education, finance. 
And so what I really love is that the Nature Conservancy, they're very creative. As a nonprofit, the Nature Conservancy is one of the biggest nonprofits in the world, I think top 10, but it doesn't have enough money to fix the world's problems. So what they do is they help to broker deals. So a deal they just brokered was with the country of Barbados. Almost 0% of the marine area around Barbados is protected. And that marine area is being affected by pollution and by warming oceans, and it's affecting the coral reefs, tourism, fisheries, water supply, and more. So what the Nature Conservancy did is they helped to connect the country of Barbados to private financers who would restructure their national debt to save them $50 million worth in interest. And they used the $50 million to protect 30% of the marine habitat around the island of Barbados. So these type of solutions are really creative. And this is my personal bias, but I feel that as a country, we have the reputation of being able to work with everybody. We have the reputation of being global citizens. And we have a lot of levers that we can use, I feel like, to help broker deals and bring together partners um, in industry, in companies, in finance, and at the national level to help find those equitable solutions. And I think that's something that we have a history of already doing, but it's something that we could do more of. That's great. Please continue, Dr. Aho. You're, you're, I, I'm only sad that we only have an hour with you. I think we could easily put in a whole day, but anyway, let's go. <laughs> uh, I'm happy to do that next time. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, sh I should add that um, I, I tried starting something new um, this summer, which is a newsletter. Never did a newsletter before. And every week I have one piece of good news and it's color coded green. I have one piece of not so good news because I feel like we need to understand what's happening. It's color coded red. And then I have one thing that people can do and it's color coded blue. <laughs> so if anybody's interested in more, in addition to the book, I also have that regular newsletter. But let me pick up again because I wanna talk about um, where we are and how do we talk about this issue in terms of solutions. So going back to where we left off, the problem we have is that climate change has become very politicized. So Gallup in the United States has been tracking people's concern levels over climate change. And in the US, as you know, there's just the two main parties. The red is Republican, the blue is Democrat. It always confuses me because their colors are switched. <laughs> and then the gray is independent. And you can see that the gap has grown wider and wider over time to the point where last year only 11% of Republicans said they were worried about climate change, whereas a record high number of Democrats said they were worried. And if you look at this a different way in the United States, just before COVID hit, climate change was, and had been for the last 10 years, at the very top of the most politically polarized issues in the US. Republicans, Democrats, the width of the gray bar shows how divided they are. Then COVID happened, and what do you think happened then? Well, this is a year later. A year later, same figure, but it's not organized in the, in the width of the gray bars now, so I'll use arrows. Oh yeah, actually, no, it is organized, and we're good. So a year later, Black Lives Matter, COVID, so addition, ad addressing issues around race was number one, COVID was number th three, climate change was still number two. Now you might say, well, that's the U.S., but Look at this map. If you had to guess what this map shows, what would you think it shows? You might think it shows where people voted in the last election and you'd be fair, that's a fair guess. But what this map actually shows is do you agree with 200 years of science? showing that digging up and burning fossil fuels is producing heat trapping gases that are wrapping an extra blanket around the planet. We are becoming rapidly as politically polarized as the US. And I can circulate some of these links afterwards if you're interested in them. As you can see, you can look up the results by writing, which is very interesting. 
Why is that? Is it because the th a thermometer gives you a different answer depending on how you vote? Of course not. In fact, 30 years ago, people weren't even questioning the science. But what happened 30 years ago? What happens is the chickens started coming home to roost. We started to see the impacts of climate change about 30 years ago. We started to see record heat waves, incredible wildfires, strong hurricanes, massive droughts. Scientists like Jim Hansen from NASA started to go before US Congress and say, this is global warming. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change put out their first report in 1990 saying this is already happening today. And if something goes from being a future issue to a present issue, what does that mean? It means we need solutions. And if we need solutions, that's where the politics comes in. And that is how climate change became politicized when people realized we need solutions. And when the biggest companies in the world, because 90 companies 9 zero, 90 companies are responsible for 70% of our carbon emissions. When those companies realized that their business model was responsible for the problem, they decided they were going to invest in politicizing the issue because they knew if it got politicized, nothing would happen. And that's what they wanted. They didn't want any, something to happen. They wanted nothing to happen. And if you want nothing to happen, what you do is you make it an issue that people could never agree on and you make it an issue that is full of fear and then people are paralyzed. And that's what they did. That is why it's so politicized in a nutshell. Now I could definitely speak a whole nother hour on exactly how it got politicized and why, but the bottom line is people with power and wealth did not want to fix it. And so they made a deliberate decision and there's a really good book and a documentary called Merchants of Doubt that talks all about exactly what they did, who they hired, who paid for it, who they talked to, how they crafted their messages. Merchants of Doubt describes exactly how this was politicized and why to delay action. So how do we get over that? Often we think, and now I'll go back to my slides, we think, well, people just need more fear. We think if they just knew the facts, if they knew how bad this was, they'd spring into action, right? And I actually have a little YouTube series called Global Weirding, not global warming, but global weirding. I don't even know how you translate that into French, <laughs> but basically the world is just getting weirder. And that's what we see. And so we say, if we just tell people the facts, surely they'll spring into action. And so climate changes and we get worried. And what we often do, and we scientists are most guilty of this, we just share more scary data. But here's the problem. If people don't understand how it matters to them and what we can do to fix it, then they reject it even more and inaction results. Because this is the way our brains are wired to work. It turns out Tali Sharat is a neuroscientist. She studies people's brains. She doesn't study climate change. But she says something in her book, The Influential Mind, that I think is so important. She says, fear and anxiety will cause us to withdraw, to freeze, to give up rather than take action. And so climate just changes more. What do we have to do? What we have to do is we have to realize that this is not the world anymore. We usually think it's, you know, me and everybody I know is worried and then nobody else is actually worried about it because they don't want to talk about it. The reality when we look at the data is that most people are worried. Over 75% of people in Canada are worried. Over 86% of young people are worried. Even the people who say they're not worried often protest too much. They're worried deep down, but they don't want to fix it. So that's why they protest. And then only a few people are activated. And that's the biggest gap we have. The biggest gap is not between the people who are or are not worried. The biggest gap we have is between the people who are worried and the people who are activated. And that's a very different paradigm. Now, there's a very helpful metric that the Yale Program on Climate Communication uses to divide people up into six different categories. And I'm not talking about the dismissives. We certainly have our fair share of dismissives in Canada. And believe me, I get emails, phone calls, Twitter messages from them every day. 
<laughs> they're very loud on social media, but they're only 8%. Now they, they all probably in Canada vote PPC. I have definitely noticed a strong correlation there. Um, but everybody else is not, they may be doubtful, they may be disengaged, they may be cautious, but they're not dismissive. And that's where we can have those conversations about two important things, about why it matters and about what we can do to fix it. Because that addresses the two most important questions that people have. They don't understand why it matters to me and they don't understand what we can do to fix it. And the first one of these is something called psychological distance. We see things as being far away in space or time, abstract rather than concrete, irrelevant to our primary concerns. I saw this when I was speaking to a group of people in um, Iowa a few months ago. I was talking about why this matters and they said, okay, that's fine, but I have a question. How do I tell people about polar bears in Iowa? And I said, well, unless you have a secret population of polar bears in Iowa that I don't know about, you don't. Because you have to talk about what matters to people. In Iowa, you can talk about floods. In Toronto, you can talk about floods. In British Columbia, you can talk about floods. You can talk about wildfires all across Northern Ontario. You can talk about rising seas in Halifax and Vancouver. You can talk about the heat waves and how I grew up in a home where we didn't have air conditioning. We just slept down the basement for the one week that was too hot to sleep upstairs. Well, now everybody's installing air conditioning and even up at the cottage where people traditionally went to get away from heat, it's too much for some people to sleep in, when, in a heat wave. We can talk about Hurricane Fiona. We can talk about homeless people on the streets of Halifax that have nowhere to go when disaster hits. We can talk about the towns in Newfoundland that were devastated by those storms. We need to talk about how it matters where we live, even though it affects everyone on all parts of the world, we have to figure out what people care about. Do you care about farming? Connect it to how climate change is affecting farming. Do you care about canoeing? Do you care about your kids' health? Do you care about the supply chain or the economy? Do you care about national security? Do you care about our forests? Do you care about fisheries? Do you care, what do you care about? Whatever people care about, climate change is already affecting it. And we have to connect the dots between how climate change is affecting what we already care about and how that makes us the perfect person to care. But that's only the first half. The second half is we have to talk about solutions. We need to talk about what those solutions look like and how we can make a difference. And this to me is where the fun part comes in because this is where we get to talk about what that better future looks like. We get to talk about how there are solutions and people are often really surprised to find out that we're implementing those solutions today. They often think that we're not doing anything. But when they learn that there are real solutions, that's where people get excited. And so that's why I feel like we need to talk about what we're doing. We need to talk about what those solutions look like. And I want to take you in just a few minutes through some of those solutions. And then hopefully we'll have just a few more minutes for questions at the end. So if you had to put the solutions in three buckets, we have to stop putting so much carbon in the atmosphere. We have to take the carbon out of the atmosphere and we have to build resilience. Those are the three things we need to do. What does that look like? Well, stopping putting carbon in the atmosphere, one of the things that might surprise us is it looks like efficiency. We waste over 50% of the energy we produce and the food we produce as well. Through efficiency, we could save a lot of money and we could provide energy and food for people who need it. Then of course there is clean energy, but there's also smart land use and agriculture. And there's behavioral changes so people don't need to burn as much energy, which costs money to get to where they're going or to heat or cool their homes or to do whatever it is they need to do. I love that there's an organization called Project Drawdown that has a hundred different solutions to climate change and they show us some of those solutions of, for efficiency, reducing the amount of energy we need. But we also need to talk, of course, about climate solutions that replace fossil fuels with clean energy, not just in Canada, but in countries around the world, many of which do not have the energy resources we do, we've been very fortunate with our energy resources. We can talk about things that we can do to use our land better. It was a farmer in Prince Edward Island who discovered that feeding cows seaweed reduced 
their methane emissions 82%. A farmer in PEI found that out, which is amazing. It's something we should be proud of. But we also need to reduce people's need for energy. And for example, working at home is one way that people have significantly reduced their energy, but buying giant SUVs has actually moved us in the opposite direction. So there's so, this touches every aspect of our lives. And this is just the first part, cutting down on the heat trapping gases that go in the atmosphere. We have to take carbon out of the atmosphere. And here's what gets really exciting because there's this amazing technology to take carbon out of the atmosphere called photosynthesis. And working with nature is phenomenal. Planting our trees, yes, we definitely need to get those trees planted, but it's not just about trees, it's about peatlands, coastal wetlands, grasslands, and farms. Farmers can be climate heroes putting carbon back into the atmosphere, into the soil where we want it, instead of the atmosphere where we don't. Project Drawdown has a lot of net nature-based climate solutions that you can look at. I should put that in the chat if you're interested. It's just an easy uh, drawdown. Dot org. If you're interested in more solutions, they have a wonderful list there. And then they have many benefits for our health, for our food, for our water, and for our air. But we also have to build resilience to the impacts that are already here today. Because as we talked about before, we know that we are already being impacted by climate change. And so that's the third piece, and we can't neglect that. So the third piece is building that resilience helping people prepare and adapt. Looking forward to the future, not back in the rearview mirror so that as climate changes, we'll be prepared and we'll be resilient. And I love all the different ways there are from engineering our built environment to technological adaptations, to working with nature, to helping the way that our systems and our social uh, networks and our cities plan and function and adapt. There's so many examples that I get super excited about here. Examples like greening low-income neighborhoods in big cities, or using green infrastructure to help direct water away from people's homes, or planting trees in sub-Saharan Africa in fields so that people can grow more food and become more drought resistant. I love talking about what I'm doing. I love talking about what my colleagues are doing. I love talking about what cities are doing. I love talking about what we're doing as a country. I love doing talking about what companies are doing and what churches are doing. And when you look at what's happening, we see climate change is not a giant boulder sitting at the bottom of the hill with only a few hands on it. It's already rolling down the hill in the right direction. It already has millions of hands on it. We just need it to go faster. And how do we get it to go faster? The catalyst is when we use our voice to help people see why it matters and what we can do to fix it and add their hand to that boulder to get it going faster. Thank you. That was outstanding. And um, I'm sure that uh, I can speak on behalf of all our colleagues. Um, thank you incredibly very much. It was really very, very wonderful. And unfortunately we are running out of time so we won't be able to do the questions. But if, if Dr. Hale, if you wouldn't mind sharing those slides with us, uh, we'll make sure to uh, pass them on to all our um, members and also, um, We'll, uh, Amy has put the, the links in, in, the ch in the chat. We'll make sure we put a package together for everyone. I think you've galvanized us uh, out of our uh, usual uh, daily lethargy. You're, you're actually better than my coffee. So, so that's, uh, <laughs> that's, 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 that, and that's very high praise coming from me. Um, and and I, I loved how you um, reframed this issue as uh, it, the, the climate change is about us and, and it's a humanitarian issue. And, and it, it caused me to reflect that a big part of what makes us human is how well we connect and support each other, whether our neighbor is sitting next to us in the Senate chamber or our neighbor is in a village where I worked a lot in Malawi or Tanzania or anywhere else. And I think that uh, who our neighbor is, is an important lesson for us to keep in mind as well. Um, our task as senators is to consider how best we as individuals and as a collective can carry out this uh, necessary work in our uh, upper chamber. Uh, so, so thank you so, so much for that. And if we're in touch with you again, don't, uh, 
don't be surprised. Um, I would just like to also thank all our staff that have put all this together and the translators and all the people that do the work behind the scenes so that we can uh, participate in this kind of excellent, uh, excellent session. So um, with that, I'm going to put an end to our talk today. And I'm sure uh, many of us will want to consider this, uh, continue this conversation uh, when we gather again this uh, afternoon. So thank you so, so much. It's been outstanding. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I don't think we're done with you yet. 